Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest Paul Angoni, and he's here today to share with us his new book, 101 Questions You Need to Ask in Your 20s. Now, Paul is a leading voice in the nation to and for the millennial generation. He is the best-selling author of several books and a highly sought-after national keynote speaker for corporations, universities, and colleges. Paul is the creator of All Grown Up, which has been read by millions of people in 190 countries. So let's welcome to the show, Paul Angoni. Thank you. It's an honor being here. Oh, what a joy it is to have you here, and what a great book. Man, I wish I had this when I was 20. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I pretty much have tried to write books that I wish I had when I was 21 as well, because uh, there's just so many unknowns and huge, uh, daunting questions. And so that's what the, the new book's about, 101 Questions You Need to Ask in Your 20s, is trying to help people ask the right questions so that they're hopefully getting to the right answers. Well, and so how did you even start on this quest to write this book? Because I know the subtitle is, let's be honest, your 30s too. And it has yeah. packed with like information. I was like, gosh, I wish I had this when I was younger. Yeah, you know, I've been, uh, I've been at this for about a decade now where I've really been focused on the college to after college or 20-something to early 30s, basically that process into becoming an adult whatever that means or looks like nowadays. And that was really my goal is trying to figure that out. How do you figure out what to do with the rest of your life and all those big life questions? And I felt like such a a failure in my early 20s. And so that's when really that passion came about of, man, this is harder than I thought it would be. I, I feel like I was supposed to launch out of college. And instead, I feel like I climbed all those stairs and I ended up back in the basement somehow with a bunch of locked doors and dark halls, and I didn't know where to go. So that's where that passion started. So this is actually my third book, really focusing in on this defining decade of our lives. Uh, and, and what do we do? And how do we do it strategically, so that we're setting ourselves up for success? Well, I'm so glad that you shared that because I felt the same way in my 20s. Hmm. You know, I went to college for a period of time and I, that that wasn't really for me and, and kind of went in a different direction. But at the same time, I was like, gosh, you know, I'm not really feeling this. It's like I, I yeah. should be doing more. And so I think you address a lot of stress that millennials and younger people feel when they hit that age. Like, gosh, I should be doing all these things. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you said it so well, you know, and it's even that that should feeling. Or, you know, in my first book, my, I have another book called 101 Secrets for Your 20s, and I talk about how life will never feel like it's supposed to. And um, and that was a, a, real, a, a realization for me because I was always wondering that kind of same question of, well, when am I going to step into my life? When am I going to experience success like I was supposed to or get married like I was supposed to or, you know, find my career like I was supposed to? And then I just started realizing, you know, what there is no supposed to. Life will never feel like my expectations of, oh, this is what it feels like to be married, or this is what it feels like to have it all figured out because I'm never going to have it all figured out. But there is a lot of angst and anxiety and depression and fear and worry that is all wrapped up into this. And I, I just didn't think we were talking about it enough. I know I wasn't with my friends and my friends, so that's really what I wanted to do is open up that door to conversation to say, you know what, this is harder than it looks. This is harder than we're making it look on social media. So we really got to talk about this because there's some real stuff going on that we need to bring out in the open. Uh, And a lot of expectations that really don't fit anybody. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I I don't know about you, but like the get married and have 3.2 kids or whatever the the deal is. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> a six-figure job. It isn't always what it turns out to be. I mean, there's a, a lot of times that people think that, oh, that I'm going to reach my ultimate happiness when I get to that. Yeah, That's not necessarily yeah, okay. yeah. And I think you know, I think uh, you know, one specific example of that, you know, is marriage. I think for a lot of us, you know, we maybe dream of getting married, or we have this feeling of, well, when I get married, I won't be lonely anymore, or I won't have these insecurities anymore. You know, or I used to go to a wedding and I'd see the couple up front and I think, wow, there's two people that really have it all figured out. 
They figured out this step and now they're getting married. This is wonderful. And then you get married and you're up there and, and you're going through the vows and you're realizing to yourself, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no, I don't know what it means to be a husband. And that's day one of starting to figure it out. But yeah, so it's, it's those expectations of, oh, this is when I get this one thing, then I'll be happy. Well, and like you said, really that ends up not being the case for most of us because a lot of it is more internal. And, and internal work that we're doing rather than that external validation of, oh, now I've arrived, I've made it, I won't be afraid or insecure anymore. Yeah, and, and most of the times people don't see the bride in the back, you know, breathing in a paper bag, you know. <laughs> 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 so, you know, it, it's uh, it, it's interesting how things come together. Well, you've got such great advice in this book, and I really feel that it's, you know, kind of regardless where you are in your path, it's great for people of all ages. How did you decide what went in this book? Yeah, so this book, like like many of my books, it, it's for, it's formulated over years and years uh, of work and research and blogs that I've written on my website. Um, you know, so it wasn't like I you know I got a book deal and then all of a sudden I'm scrambling to figure out okay what are the most important questions. You know, a lot of this was formulated through about a five-year process as I really dove down deep in in research. You know, I ended up getting my master's degree where I studied a lot about emerging adulthood uh, and the the theories around generational dynamics and the workplace and things like that. So I just, I guess I I guess I just kept this running tab in a sense of the questions that people would ask me or that I would wrestle with, or I felt like these are the most important things. This is getting down to the heart of these struggles of career or relationships, or what does it mean to be an adult, or what does it mean to find my purpose or passion that we talk about so much. So I tried to break it down into those categories and just try to bring the best of the best, the stuff that I felt like was resonating the most with myself and also with readers over a span of time. And then that ended up being, you know, this book. is, is And hopefully it has that feeling of, you know, okay, there's a culmination of a lot of good questions in this. You're obviously the right person to bring this book together, and it does touch on so many key questions. I mean, we you briefly touched on loneliness, and you know, a lot of people are going through like anxiety right now, and that's a huge thing. Do you feel that when you added these type of topics in this book, it was due to the blog that you're writing and and just the overwhelming response that you're getting? Yeah, you know, I think. I think that's a beautiful thing about today's age and creating content online is I'm almost, in a sense, what I call market testing ideas and, and beta testing ideas to put it in like business entrepreneurial sense that I'm, I'm putting these ideas out there. And usually it's stuff that I'm wrestling with internally. And so I'm just trying to make sense of it and, and I'm putting it out there. And then I kind of see what sticks and see what people uh, seem to be sharing or commenting the most on, or it just seems like it's having the biggest impact. And then I've gotten, I've gotten so much feedback, thousands and thousands of emails over the years. And really the email that I still receive the most is, uh, thank you for writing this because I felt so alone. I felt like I was the only one going through this. I felt like I was the only one struggling. So I really hit on that theme a lot to constantly just be reminding everybody, including myself, that you're not alone in this, that, that this is supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be difficult. Uh, and it's a process, so we need to help each other through it and openly talk about it because we, we try to do it in isolation, but that's the biggest problem of all. Uh, and so I try to break open those stigmas and, and create community around it. Yeah, I think one of the things that you hear all the time is people, there's like this epidemic of people who feel alone or lonely. And so yeah. addressing it really helps because, you know, people, when they're in that space, they're like, gosh, this is just me. No one else is going through what I'm going through. I feel so yeah. isolated from the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah. And we need that sense of, uh, you know, and so that's why I ask a few questions in my book, like, am I struggling to make it appear like I'm not struggling? And and I feel like a lot of our time and effort is 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 wrapped around that phenomenon of spending so much struggle to make it look like you're not struggling, which then cements the struggles, the real struggles even more, and especially with social media and what I call a different kind of uh, OCD. I call it obsessive comparison disorder. And and I feel like that's such a huge problem in today's age of this constant overwhelming comparison that we're doing online 
you know, you used to have to go to your 10 year reunion to look everybody up and down to see who's doing better than whom. And, and now we're pulling off that same phenomenon every single moment with every single post. And, and so it doesn't, it creates this kind of isolating factor that we're, we're globally connected, but then we're not having this authentic conversation because we're all struggling to make it look like we're not struggling whatsoever. Well, and so what is your advice for people? And, and, because we're not going to touch everything because that's 101, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of advice in this book. But what would be your advice to people who are going through periods of loneliness? Because I think that's a good one to kind of touch on. Well, first of all, it's it's that what we just touched on, you're not alone in it, you know, and there's lots of people that are feeling the same way. And, um, and, and also that this feeling of, you know, we don't, we don't really connect with each other over our pretend perfection. We connect over our shared struggle. And so that's actually this amazing connecting place when you are feeling this way, when you're feeling lonely, when you're feeling depressed or, or frustrated or insecure, is when you're willing to open up about that, when you're willing to go first with a friend at coffee or with a parent or with a counselor or, or a, uh, a pastor or a priest or whoever, you open up this amazing uh conversation where where then that allows the other person to say, you know what, I've gone through that as well, or I've experienced that, or I know what that's like. And, and so it, it creates this sense of validation in a sense where you're not going through it alone. And so I think that's the biggest thing is you have to be willing sometimes to go first, to put your story out there, to be willing to be honest. And it's a very freeing process because now all those monsters, so to speak, that you feel like you're trying to hide in the closet, you realize, well, they're not as ugly or as, you know, specific as I thought they were. You know, other people are going through this as well. And that's such a freeing realization that you're not going through this alone. And so we need to talk about it with people, trusted people in our lives. What are some of the other topics in your book that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Well, it's broken down into four categories. So I talk about career questions, you know, how do you find that right career, that right fit, relationship questions, uh, questions about what does it mean to be an adult, and, and then also questions what I call around this category of finding your signature sauce. And uh, and I guess I'll stick on that just for a second. And this, this idea and metaphor of signature sauce is my idea of kind of how do I wrap my mind around calling and purpose and passion, vocation, kind of this deeper sense of doing work that matters, that we believe in. And for me, I picture this kind of master chef in a kitchen, and they're putting these ingredients together, and they're trying to create this flavor that is so unique that that only they can bring, that people are going to want, that people are going to need. And I feel like that's what it's like for each of us, that we're going into the kitchen, we have these different ingredients, we don't quite know how it's all going to blend together, and it's a process of figuring that out. And there's going to be a lot of experiments that go up in flames that don't work out. But, but I really do think it's important to take the time and the effort and to, to experiment with those ingredients in your life, you know, your skill sets, your values, your um, strengths, your relationships in your life. How do these blend together to create that sense of, okay, yeah, this is the work I should be doing that is, that is specific to me where I'm giving the world this unique flavor that they need? Or it fulfills us so much, you know, because I know that you talk about that as well. Yeah, and – you know, for me, I want to do, I want to live on purpose with purpose for a purpose. You know, and I think a lot of my generation, we we want that as well, and I think everybody wants that. That sort of, this is something significant, and and it's going to be different for all of us because we all have different stories, and and we all have different pain and and stuff that we've had to work through, that then becomes our passion, so to speak. You know, that was definitely true for me, where I had to work through a lot of failure and frustration in my 20s and so then that became my passion and I think that's true for a lot of us that that tough stuff this the hardest stuff you've had to go through you know a lot of times that gets redeemed because now you want to help other people going through something similar you want to help rectify that problem in somebody else's life and and that's that's powerful yeah and a lot of times it's really interesting just where our journeys um, take us I mean if I look back when I was in my 20s I'd have no idea that my path would lead me to where I am today. But all yeah. the experience that I have has brought me to where I am. Yeah, there's nothing There's nothing lost. You know, it's 
you're picking up these different skills, these experiences, these, these things that are unique to you and you're on this path. And so that's why when somebody comes up to me and says, well, I feel so lost, you know, I say, well, that's, that's great. You feel lost because, you know, that's the first part to exploring. You know, you, you have to get a little lost if you're going to explore something new. You know, all explorers get lost, but again, they get lost on purpose with purpose, with a sense of, okay, I might not know where I'm ending up, but gosh, I'm going to head this direction and I'm going to learn a lot about the, the land around me, about myself, about everything as I end up. And maybe I'm not going to even end up at the place I thought I was going to end up, but man, I'm going to gain all these skills and experiences as I go along the way. So it's okay if it takes more time than we think it's going to take. And that's why I'm always reminding 20-somethings that success in your 20s, I feel like, is more about setting the table than it is about enjoying the feast. Thank you for saying that. Thank you so much for saying that. <laughs> I think a lot of times people in their 20s feel like I've got to set the table, probably burn the meal, you know, recook, <laughs> and then, you know, go ahead and enjoy the feast. And, and it's interesting because there's so much pressure, I think, that young, you know, younger people feel that they don't really need to take on. Yeah, and, and this, this fear of failure, you know, and that's why I'm constantly telling myself and other people that I'm, I'm helping is that you're going to fail. You have to fail. You know, the biggest failure of our lives would be if we never had any. You know, that would be the biggest failure. You know, these strategic risks that we're taking are so important. You know, fail, fail, uh, and, and then learn from it. Um, but just don't call yourself a failure. And I think that's what a lot of us do is that we fail at something. It doesn't go as we planned. And then we start bringing on these terms and these nouns of these names. You know, I'm a failure. I can't do this. Um, no, that's not the case. The, you know, the failing part is an important part of this process. Um, you know, and you've got to keep writing those pages to get to the page that, that you really needed to get to. And, and maybe you, won't, you might throw out the other pages that you're writing before, you know, metaphorically. And so we, we need that, that failure in our lives because the possibility for greatness and embarrassment – they both exist in the same space. You can't do anything great if you're not willing to be embarrassed in the process. And, and take chances, for sure. And I love how your book also addresses things like disappointment and complaining. And you have this chapter. I, I don't know who came up with these chapters. I'm guessing it's you because these are, some of them are hysterical. Like being in disappointment, like a cat taking a nap in its own litter box. You know what? And sometimes it's relatable. It's like, even if you don't have a cat, you know, you know, yeah, we all know that smell. We've all been in a house that has that smell going on, whether it's ours or somebody else's. (laughs) But it's, it's interesting because it's such a great analogy for people to look at and go, okay, you know, maybe I need to rethink how I'm handling my disappointment or what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're right. They, they all are my brainchild, you know, because I don't think anybody would want to take ownership of some, of some of the ways I phrase things because I do, I do try to phrase things in a humorous or, or impactful way. Um, but, and, and again, it's most of the stuff that I've realized that I've had to work through that, you know, that I'm thinking so much about, oh, why didn't this go as I planned? Or, oh, man, this was a failure again, you know, or those kind of things. And it's like, well, am I just bathing in this stuff? Am I constantly going back to this sense of complaining or why can't this one thing happen? You know, and again, it's that sense of, well, gosh, it's it's never going to happen exactly like I want it to happen. And it's not, and it probably shouldn't. You know, if things turned out exactly like I wanted them to turn out, man, I would have been crushed and, and, and a bigger failure in many ways because I wouldn't have been able to sustain uh, much because I wouldn't have grown any strengths and what I needed to, to grow in. And so it really does take those times of, of struggle and strain and you know, perseverance, humility, things that we don't really want to talk about or go through, but are so important so that you can do something meaningful and, and large. And so you have the strength to carry that weight uh, because it can get very heavy and so we need that. We need those experiences. What is, um, why don't you share with us one of the questions that you feel that you get a lot? I know we've covered a few of them already, but maybe another question that you seem to, in your experience, you, you have people reaching out to you asking. Yeah, you know, I ask a lot of questions. You know, I get a lot of questions about, 
you know, just real specific questions even, you know, I just got one on, you know, on Twitter yesterday where it was, it was you know, career change type questions or this, this career doesn't seem like a fit for me or my job just, it's not really working and I don't know what to do about it. I don't know how to change. I don't even know how to find a career or a job that I do enjoy. And so I get a lot of those. And so one of my questions in, in the book is I try to break down uh, what is your dread, tolerate, and love ratio in your job. So I even have this pie chart in, in the book that you can write in, you know, and there's different sections of the book that you literally are writing in. And I ask people, you know, if you're in a current job or an internship or whatever it might be, trying to break it down, go through a day and break down the percentages of, okay, this is the percentage that I really love. This is the percentage that I'm just kind of tolerating getting through. And these are the percentages that I really am dreading. And I think that even helps us give a, a clearer picture so we can see it and be like, okay, well, 95% of my job is, is dread. Well, why is that? Is that, is that because of me? Is that because of the, the actual job? Is it the people? So I think we get more clarity in that sense. Um, and then also, you know, if, if it's not a good job, if it feels like a, a lousy job, I, I encourage people to, okay, well, is there that one sliver? Is that, what's that 5% even of something that you love doing? And what is it about that? And can you do more of that? How do you grow your skill set into that love category so that you can do more of it in your current job, maybe switch your position, talk to your boss, or maybe, yeah, it's for that next job. You can hone in on more of what you do enjoy doing, but you've grown a skill set even in a job that feels lousy. And so I'm constantly telling everybody, you know, that if you do a lousy job at your lousy job, well, then more lousy jobs await. You got, you got to break the cycle somehow and do a really good job, even at your lousy job and find that 5%, 10%, 20% that you love and keep leveraging that into more and more. Oh, I love that advice. And I think that's perfect because then at least you leave, you know, that lousy job feeling like I did the best that I could. You feel good about yourself. Yeah. And you're setting yourself up better for success later on because now you've grown and harnessed more of a skill set and a strength so that you can take that to your next opportunity and start at a much higher level versus, you know, just leaving with nothing, feeling like you got really nothing out of it, just hopping to another job just because, and then realizing six months into that job that a lot of the same problems surface. So we got to do some of that hard internal work and, and, and grow in a skill set so that we can keep leveraging that to a better, a better opportunity later on. Well, let's say someone purchases the book. Of course, we want them to pick up 101 questions you need to ask in your 20s. Let's say they get the book and they feel like they need more. You have online courses, right? Yeah, I do. And in for this first print run that we've done with the book, you know, um, and it, it might be running out soon. So I think that we're getting close to the last opportunity to do this. But in the first page of the book, there's basically instructions on if you buy the book, you, you can get my uh, online course for free. And uh, this is uh, signaturesauce.com is, is where I do my online course talking about Signature Sauce again. And in that course, I break it down into 10 modules where I'm teaching on each module. And then I also bring in a lot of experts and leaders and I'm interviewing them. So there's a lot more content in that course and teaching that really pairs well with the book. And, and it's a course that people usually paid, you know, good money to go through, but I wanted to make it free just because I felt like, man, this would be the most helpful extension of the book. So, so yeah, if you grab the book now, you can also get, uh, you know, a good online course for free where I'm teaching a lot about these topics to hopefully just take you to a different place and to actually promote change and transition. So it's not just a book that you read and put down, but it actually creates movement. Mm-hmm. Love that. Well, and it's great. Um, your website's so great because it also has all these resources that people can connect and be part of your community. There's a quiz. You've got a lot of very interactive things going on. Yeah, and that's and that's my that's more my home base website. Sorry, I have too many websites, but that's my allgrownup.com website. And grown is spelled G R O A N, like you're groaning in pain, growing pains, and that's why I did it. But allgrownup.com. Yeah, I've been running that website for about eight years. There's so many free articles on there, uh, quizzes, like you said, videos, interviews, a lot of good content. And you can snag free chapters from all my books on allgrownup.com as well. So if you just wanted to test 
uh, all three of my books, you can grab chapters from those by jumping on allgrownup.com. I have a few more questions before I let you go here. So if someone's yes, please let's keep going. We got 101. <laughs> we should co- you know we could cover. So we got a lot of content. <laughs> Oh, easily. And you're, I mean, it's, it, you're so much fun to talk with and your information is so amazing. I absolutely love this book and uh, can't say enough good things about it. You do coaching as well, right? So if someone's like, you know, I think I do better with more hands-on experience. Do you still offer coaching or is that, like, I'm sure you have a huge waiting list for that. I, I, I do. You know, most of it will come through uh, the online course. Sometimes I do groups through the course and so we kind of do group coaching but there is sometimes that I'll do specific individual coaching on a very specific basis um, because you're right, time time just gets more limited these days. And uh, and especially, you know, I have three kids as well, you know, seven, five, and two-year-old. And uh, anybody that has kids know that they take up a lot of time as well. So, so I do do some group coaching. I do some individual. I do some coaching with leaders as well because another hat that I wear per se is uh, – is I do a lot of corporate speaking too to help leaders who are struggling with engaging and retaining and marketing to this younger generation. And so that's a fun uh, extension is being able to talk to leaders and even coach them or, or speak at, uh, you know, do a keynote at their business or a conference or something. So I love, I love, I definitely love interacting with people in a real time way and not just hiding behind books or a website and be, and being in a, in a, inaccessible to people. Well, there's a reason they call it the terrible twos because I think that's when they pick up the whole no thing, right? Oh man, <laughs> I, my our two year old, we are starting to figure out he's saying no way. He's saying oh. no way all the time, so he's even added the way into it to make sure we know that his no is serious. <laughs> it's not happening. And, <laughs> well, and I think that some companies that do hire you for the corporate speaking, I mean, how progressive are they when they're looking to get ahead of this? Because, you know, millennials, they are totally different cats than the rest of the generations that have come before them. Yeah, and there's there's just a lot to navigate through, and so there's a lot that we need to break down. And and typically my role, I, I kind of see myself as kind of this middleman, so to speak, where I'm trying to bring millennials or kind of the younger generation. Hey, we got to work on this. Let's think about this. How do we come more to the middle? And then I'm trying to talk to leaders and say, Hey, can we work on this? Can we think about this? How do how do you guys come more to the middle? So that it's kind of like a handshake, you know, that we're both coming towards this. So it's not just, hey, leaders, you got to cater to millennials and this and this, and this is how you change your whole company, or, or hey, millennials, just figure it out, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, don't ask questions. You know, I'm trying to do, trying to help them have an authentic connection and something that's meaningful and and have re- deeper relationships, so that they're creating better products, that they have a better work environment. And so I do, I do love that aspect of getting to work with leaders who are working with thousands and maybe, you know, hundreds of thousands of millennials and, and making an impact in that way. And what a big difference that makes, because I know what I love about millennials is that they're all about making impact and doing something that really matters, you know, that they feel that is, is important to them. And I think when companies understand and get behind that, it makes such a huge difference. And you can imagine just how that would propel everyone forward. Oh man, it makes such a huge difference. Just the the different factors of what brings job satisfaction or life satisfaction for a millennial could be very different. And you're right. A lot of it is around this this idea and I I kind of couch it in this this fear of insignificance. The millennials are are definitely afraid to have this they feel like they're insignificant. They they, they don't matter in their job. What they're doing doesn't matter. And so as leaders trying to couch things and what I call this significant why, you know, why are we doing this? Why is this important? Why is even the simple process or, or procedure that we're doing every day, why is this a bigger part of this greater good, this greater thing, and making sure we're couching this in the significant why so that people understand the full picture and they feel motivated by it and they feel like they're a part of something bigger rather than just the cog turning every day for no real reason and they, they don't really understand. So figuring out that significant why, uh, both for all of us individually, but also for a company. 
Well, Paul, we can obviously talk for hours in regards to this topic and, and your books. You have such great information. Unfortunately, um, we are kind of at the end of our time here. Where, again, can people connect with you and be part of your community? Yeah, all, allgrownup.com is the, is the best first spot to go to. And, that, again, that's G-R-O-A-N, allgrownup.com. You can find hundreds of articles there and chapters from my books. And then also on social media, obviously, on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. And typically it's around my name, Paul Angoni, and that's A-N-G-O-N-E. It's a good Italian name, Paul Angoni. Um, They can find me across social media platforms and reach out that way or reach out through my website or through my books. And, uh, And I'm here and I'm accessible. And if you have questions or if you feel all alone, please reach out. Don't, don't just hold this all in by yourself. Well, thank you, Paul. It has been such a pleasure to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, 101 Questions You Need to Ask in Your 20s. Again, if you'd like to connect with Paul, you can at his website, paulangoni.com or at allgrownup.com and reach out to him there. The book's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and of course, all major retailers. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.